Section 24 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Blind Man's Holiday, Part 2. Two ponderous policemen were conducting between them a woman dressed as if for the stage, in a short white satiny skirt, reaching to the knees, pink stockings, and a sort of sleeveless bodice, bright with relucent armor-like scales. Upon her curly light hair was perched, at a rollicking angle, a shining tin helmet. The costume was to be instantly recognized as one of those amazing conceptions to which competition has harried the inventors of the spectacular ballet. One of the officers bore a long cloak upon his arm, which doubtless had been intended to veil the candid attractions of their fulgent prisoner. But for some reason it had not been called into use, to the vociferous delight of the tail of the procession. Compelled by a sudden and vigorous movement of the woman, the parade halted before the window by which Lorison stood. He saw that she was young, and, at the first glance, was deceived by a sophistical prettiness of her face, which waned before more judicious scrutiny. Her look was bold and reckless, and upon her countenance, where yet the contours of youth survived, were the finger marks of old ages, credentialed courier, late hours. The young woman fixed her unshrinking gaze upon Lorison, and called to him in the voice of the wronged heroine in the straits. Say, you look like a good fellow. Come and put up the bail, won't you? I've done nothing to get pinched for. It's all a mistake. See how they're treating me? You won't be sorry if you'll help me out of this. Think of your sister or your girl being dragged along the streets this way. I say, come along now like a good fellow. It may be that Lorison, in spite of the unconvincing bathos of this appeal, showed a sympathetic face, for one of the officers left the woman's side and went over to him. It's all right, sir, he said, in a husky, confidential tone. She's the right party. We took her after the first act at the Greenlight Theater, on a wire from the chief of police of Chicago. It's only a square or two to the station. Her rig's pretty bad, but she refused to change clothes, or rather, added the officer with a smile, to put on some. I thought I'd explain matters to you so you wouldn't think she was being imposed upon. What is the charge? asked Lorison. Grand larceny, diamonds. Her husband is a jeweler in Chicago. She cleaned his showcase of the sparklers and skipped with a comic opera troupe. The policeman, perceiving that the interest of the entire group of spectators was centered upon himself and Lorison, their conference being regarded as a possible new complication, was fain to prolong the situation, which reflected his own importance, by a little afterpiece of philosophical comment. A gentleman like you, sir, he went on affably, would never notice it. But it comes in my line to observe what an immense amount of trouble is made by that combination. I mean the stage, diamonds, and light-headed women, who aren't satisfied with good homes. I tell you, sir, a man these days and nights wants to know what his woman folk are up to. The policeman smiled a good night and returned to the side of his charge, who had been intently watching Lorison's face during the conversation, no doubt for some indication of his intention to render succor. Now, at the failure of the sign, and at the movement made to continue the ignominious progress, she abandoned hope and addressed him thus pointedly. You damn chalk-faced quitter, you was thinking of giving me a hand, but you let the cop talk you out of it, the first word. You're a dandy to tie to. Say, if you ever get a girl, she'll have a picnic. Won't she work you to the queen's taste? Oh, my. She concluded with a taunting, shrill laugh that rasped Lorison like a saw. The policeman urged her forward. The delighted train of gaping followers closed up the rear, and the captive Amazon, accepting her fate, extended the scope of her maledictions so that none in hearing might seem to be slighted. Then came upon Lorison an overwhelming revulsion of his perspective. It may be that he had been ripe for it, that the abnormal condition of mind in which he had for so long existed was already about to revert to its balance. However, it is certain that the events of the last few minutes had furnished the channel, if not the impetus, for the change. 
the initial determining influence had been so small a thing as the fact and manner of his having been approached by the officer. The agent had, by the style of his accost, restored the loiterer to his former place in society. In an instant, he had been transformed from a somewhat rancid prowler along the fishy side streets of gentility into an honest gentleman, with whom even so lordly a guardian as the peace might agreeably exchange the compliments. This, then, first broke the spell and set thrilling in him a resurrected longing for the fellowship of his kind and the rewards of the virtuous. To what end, he vehemently asked himself, was this fanciful self-accusation, this empty renunciation. This moral squeamishness through which he had been led to abandon what was his heritage in life, and not beyond his deserts. Technically, he was uncondemned. His sole guilty spot was in thought rather than deed, and cognizance of it unshared by others. For what good, moral or sentimental, did he slink, retreating like a hedgehog from his own shadow to and fro in this musty bohemia that lacked even the picturesque? But the thing that struck home and set him raging was the part played by the Amazon prisoner. To the counterpart of that astounding belligerent, identical at least in way of experience to the one by her own confession, thus had fallen, had he, not three hours since, been united in marriage. How desirable and natural it had seemed to him then, and how monstrous it seemed now. How the words of Diamond Thief number two yet burned in his ears. If you ever get a girl, she'll have a picnic. What did that mean but that women instinctively knew him for one they could hoodwink? Still again, there reverberated the policeman's sapient contribution to his agony. A man these days and nights wants to know what his women folks are up to. Oh, yes, he had been a fool. He had looked at things from the wrong standpoint. But the wildest note in all the clamor was struck by Payne's forefinger. Jealousy. Now, at least, he felt that keenest sting, a mounting love unworthily bestowed. Whatever she might be, he loved her. He bore in his own breast his doom, a grating comic flavor to his predicament struck him suddenly, and he laughed creakingly as he swung down the echoing pavement. An impetuous desire to act, to battle with his fate, seized him. He stopped upon his heel and smote his palms together triumphantly. His wife was where? But there was a tangible link, an outlet more or less navigable, through which his derelict ship of matrimony might yet be safely towed the priest. Like all imaginative men with pliable natures, Lorison was, when thoroughly stirred, apt to become temptuous. With a high and stubborn indignation upon him, he retraced his steps to the intersecting street by which he had come. Down this he hurried to the corner where he had parted with, an astringent grimace, tinctured, the thought, his wife. Thence, still back, he harked. Following through an unfamiliar district, he stimulated recollections of the way they had come from that preposterous wedding. Many times he went abroad and nosed his way back to the trail, furious. At last, when he reached the dark, calamitous building in which his madness had culminated and found the black hallway, he dashed down it, perceiving no light or sound. But he raised his voice, hailing loudly, reckless of everything, but that he should find the old mischief-maker with the eyes that looked too far away to see the disaster he had wrought. The door opened, and in the stream of light, Father Rogan stood, his book in hand, with his finger marking the place. "'Ah!' cried Lorison. "'You're the man I want. I had a wife of you a few hours ago. I would not trouble you, but I neglected to note how it was done. Will you oblige me with the information, whether the business is beyond remedy?' "'Come inside,' said the priest. "'There are other lodgers in the house "'who might prefer sleep to even a gratified curiosity.' "'Lorison entered the room "'and took the chair offered him. "'The priest's eyes looked a courteous interrogation. "'I must apologize again,' said the young man, "'for so soon intruding upon you "'with my marital infelicities. 
but as my wife has neglected to furnish me with her address, I am deprived of the legitimate recourse of a family row. I am quite a plain man, said Father Rogin pleasantly, but I do not see how I am to ask you questions. Pardon my indirectness, said Lawrenson, but I will ask one. In this room tonight you pronounced me to be a husband. You afterwards spoke of additional rights or performances that either should or could be affected. I paid little attention to your words then, but I am hungry to hear them repeated now. As matters stand, am I married past all help? You are as legally and as firmly bound, said the priest, as though it had been done in a cathedral in the presence of thousands. The additional observances I referred to are not necessary to the strictest legality of the act, but were advised as a precaution for the future, for convenience of proof in such contingencies as wills, inheritances, and the like. Lawrenson laughed harshly. Many thanks, he said. Then there is no mistake, and I am the happy Benedict. I suppose I should go stand upon the bridal corner, and when my wife gets through walking the streets, she will look me up. Father Rogan regarded him calmly. My son, he said, when a man and woman come to me to be married, I always marry them. I do this for the sake of other people whom they might go away and marry if they do not marry each other. As you see, I do not seek your confidence, but your case seems to me to be one not altogether devoid of interest. Very few marriages that have come to my notice have brought such well-expressed regret within so short a time. I will hazard one question. Were you not under the impression that you loved the lady you married at the time you did so? Loved her, cried Lorison wildly, never so well as now, though she told me she deceived and sinned and stole. Never more than now, when perhaps she is laughing at the fool she cajoled and left with scarcely a word to return the God only knows what particular line of her former folly. Father Rogan answered nothing. During the silence that succeeded, he sat with a quiet expectation beaming in his full, lambent eye. If you would listen, began Lawrenson, the priest held up his hand. As I hoped, he said, I thought you would trust me. Wait but a moment. He brought a long clay pipe, filled and lighted it. Now, my son, he said. Lawrenson poured a twelve months accumulated confidence in the father Rogan's ears. He told all, not sparing himself, or omitting the facts of his past, the events of the night, or his disturbing conjectures and fears. The main point, said the priest, when he had concluded, seems to me to be this. Are you reasonably sure that you love this woman whom you have married? Why, exclaimed Lorison, raising impulsively to his feet, why should I deny it? But look at me. Am fish, flesh, or fowl? That is the main point to me, I assure you. I understand you, said the priest, also rising and laying down his pipe. The situation is one that has taxed the endurance of much older men than you. In fact, especially much older men than you. I will try to relieve you from it, and this night. You shall see for yourself into exactly what predicament you have fallen, and how you shall, possibly, be extricated. There is no evidence so credible as that of the eyesight. Father Rogan moved about the room and donned a soft black hat. Buttoning his coat to his throat, he laid a hand on the doorknob. Let us walk, he said. The two went out upon the street. The priest turned his face down it, and Lawrenson walked with him through a squalid district, where the houses loomed awry and desolate-looking high above them. Presently they turned into a less dismal side street, where the houses were smaller, and though hinting of the most meager comfort, lacked the concentrated wretchedness of the more populous byways. At a segregated two-story house, Father Rogan halted and mounted the steps with the confidence of a familiar visitor. He ushered Lawrenson into a narrow hallway, faintly lighted by a cobwebbed hanging lamp. Almost immediately a door to the right opened, and a dingy Irish woman protruded her head. "'Good evening to you, Mistress Gahan,' said the priest, unconsciously. It seemed falling into a delicately flavored brogue. And it is yourself can tell me if Nora has gone out again the night, maybe. "'Oh, yes, your blessed reverence, sure, and I can tell you the same. 
The pretty darling went out as usual, but a bit later, and she says, Mother Gahan, says she, it's me last night out, praise the saints, tis night is. And oh, your reverence, the sweet, beautiful dream of a dress that has this tomey, white satin and silk and ribbons and lace about the neck and arms, twas a sin, your reverence, the gold was sprint upon it. The priest heard Lawrenson catch his breath painfully, and a faint smile flickered across his own clean-cut mouth. "'Well, then, Mistress Gayen said he, "'I'll just step upstairs and see the bit boy for a minute, "'and I'll take this gentleman up with me.' "'He'll wake him,' said the woman. "'I've just come down from sitting with him the last hour, "'telling him the fine stories of old County Tyron. "'Tis a greedy godson. "'It is, your reverence, for me stories.' Small the doubt, said Father Reagan. There's no rockin' would put him to sleep the quicker, I'm thinkin'. Amid the woman's shrill protest against the retort, the two men ascended the steep stairway. The priest pushed open the door of a room near its top. Is that you already, sister? drawled a sweet childish voice from the darkness. It is only old Father Denny to come see a darling, and a fine gentleman I brought to make you and call. And you reserve us fast asleep in bed. Shame on your manners. Oh, Father Denny, is that you? I'm glad. And will you light the lamp, please? It's on the table by the door. And quit talking like Mother Gahan, Father Denny. The priest lit the lamp, and Lawrenson saw a tiny, tousle-haired boy with a thin, delicate face sitting up in a small bed in a corner. Quickly, also, his rapid glance considered the room and its contents. It was furnished with more than comfort, and its adornments plainly indicated a woman's discerning taste. An open door beyond revealed the blackness of an adjoining room's interior. The boy clutched both of Father Rogan's hands. I'm so glad you came, he said, but why did you come in the night? Did Sister send you? Off with ye. Am I to be sent about at me age, as was Terence McShane of Bally Mahone? I come on my own responsibility. Lorison had also advanced to the boy's bedside. He was fond of children, and the wee fellow, laying himself down to sleep alone in the dark room, stirred his heart. Aren't you afraid, little man, he asked, stooping down beside him. Sometimes, answered the boy with a shy smile, when the rats make too much noise. But nearly every night, when sister goes out, Mother Gahan stays a while with me and tells me funny stories. I'm not often afraid, sir. This brave little gentleman, said Father Rogan, is a scholar of mine. Every day, from half-past six to half-past eight, when Sister comes for him, he stops in my study, and we find out what's in the inside of books. He knows multiplication, division, and fractions, and he's troubling me to begin with the chronicles of Saren of Clone MacNoise, Curac McCullen, and Curran O'Loughlin, the great Irish historians. The boy was evidently accustomed to the priest's Celtic pleasantries. A little appreciative grin was all the attention the insinuation of pedantry received. Lorison, to have saved his life, could not have put to the child one of those vital questions that were wildly beating about, unanswered, in his own brain. The little fellow was very like Nora, he had the same shining hair and candid eyes. Oh, Father Danny, cried the boar suddenly, I forgot to tell you. Sister's not going away at night any more. She told me so when she kissed me good night as she was leaving. And she said she was so happy, and then she cried, wasn't that queer? But I'm glad, aren't you? Yes, lad. And now, the Omaha, go to sleep, and say good night, we must be going. Which shall I do first, Father Denny? Faith, he caught me again. Wait till I get the Sinatch into the animals of Taraguch, the hagiographer, and I'll give him enough of the Irish idiom to make him more respectful. The light was out, and the small, brave voice bidding them good night from the dark room. They groped downstairs and tore away from the garrulity of Mother Gahan. Again the priest steered them through the dim ways, but this time in another direction. His conductor was serenely silent, and Lawrenson followed his example to the extent of seldom speaking. Serene he could not be. 
His heart beat suffocatingly in his breast. The following of this blind, menacing trail was pregnant with he knew not what humiliating revelation to be delivered at its end. They came into a more pretentious street where trade, it could be surmised, flourished by day. And again the priest paused, this time before a lofty building whose great doors and windows in the lowest floor were carefully shuttered and barred. Its higher apertures were dark, save in the third story, the windows of which were brilliantly lighted. Lorison's ear caught a distant, regular, pleasing thrumming, as of music above. They stood at an angle to the building. Up along the side nearest them mounted an iron stairway. At its top was an upright, illuminated parallelogram. Father Reagan had stopped and stood musing. I will say this much, he remarked thoughtfully. I believe you to be a better man than you think yourself to be, a better man than I thought some hours ago. But do not take this, he added with a smile, as much praise. I promise you a possible deliverance from an unhappy perplexity. I will have to modify that promise. I can only remove the mystery that enhanced that perplexity. Your deliverance depends upon yourself. Come. He led his companion up the stairway. Halfway up, Lorison caught him by the sleeve. Remember, he gasped, I love that woman. You desire to know. I go on. The priest reached the landing at the top of the stairway. Lorison, behind him, saw the illuminated space was the glass upper half of a door opening into the lighted room. The rhythmic music increased as they neared it. The stair shook with the mellow vibrations. Lorison stopped breathing when he set foot upon the highest step, for the priest stood aside and motioned him to look through the glass of the door. His eyes, accustomed to the darkness, met first a blinding glare, and then he made out the faces and forms of many people, amid an extravagant display of splendid robings, billowy laces, brilliant-hued finery, ribbon silks, and misty drapery. And then he caught the meaning of that jarring hum, and he saw the tired, pale, happy face of his wife bending, as were a score of others, over her sewing machine, toiling, toiling. Here was the folly she pursued, and the end of his quest. But not his deliverance. Though even then remorse struck him. His shamed soul fluttered once more before it retired to make room for the other and better one. For the temperous thrill of joy, the shine of the satin, and the glimmer of ornaments recalled the disturbing figure of the bespangled Amazon, and the base duplicate histories lit by the glare of footlights and stolen diamonds. It is past the wisdom of him who only sets the scenes, either to praise or blame the man. But this time his love overcame his scruples. He took a quick step and reached out his hand for the doorknob. Father Rogan was quicker to arrest it and draw him back. "'You use my trust in you queerly,' said the priest sternly. "'What are you about to do?' "'I'm going to my wife,' said Lawrenson. "'Let me pass.' Listen, said the priest, holding him firmly by the arm. I am about to put you in possession of a piece of knowledge of which, thus far, you have scarcely proved deserving. I do not think you ever will, but I will not dwell upon that. You see in that room the woman you married, working for a frugal living for herself and a generous comfort for an idolized brother. This building belongs to the chief costumer of the city. For months the advance orders for the coming Mardi Gras festival, have kept the work going day and night. I myself secured employment here for Nora. She toils here each night from nine o'clock until daylight, and besides, carries home with her some of the finer costumes requiring more delicate needlework, and works there part of the day. Somehow, you two have remained strangely ignorant of each other's lives. Are you convinced now that your wife is not walking the streets? Let me go to her, cried Lawrenson, again struggling, and beg her forgiveness. Sir, said the priest, do you owe me nothing? Be quiet. It seems so often that heaven lets fall its choicest gifts into the hands that must be taught to hold them. Listen again. You forgot that repentant sin must not compromise, but look up for redemption, to the purest and best. You went to her with a fine-spun sophistry 
that peace could be found in a mutual guilt, and she, fearful of losing what her heart so craved, thought it worth the price to buy it with a desperate, pure, beautiful lie. I have known her since the day she was born. She is as innocent and unsullied in life, and deed as a holy saint. In that lowly street where she dwells, she first saw the light, and she has lived there ever since, spending her days in generous self-sacrifice for others. Oh, ye spalpeen, continued Father Reagan, raising his finger in kindly anger at Lawrenson. What for, I wonder, could she be after, making a fool of herself, and shaming her soul with lies for the likes of you? Sir, said Lawrenson, trembling, say what you please of me, doubt it as you must. I will yet prove my gratitude to you and my devotion to her. But let me speak to her once now. Let me kneel just for one moment at her feet and... Tut, tut, said the priest. How many acts of love, drama, do you think an old bookworm like me capable of witnessing? Besides, what kind of figures do we cut? Spying upon the mysteries of midnight millinery? Go to meet your wife tomorrow as she ordered you and obey her thereafter. And maybe sometime I shall get forgiveness for the part I have played in this night's work. Off with you now down the stairs. Tis late, and an old man like me should be taking his rest. End of Part 2 of Blind Man's Holiday